so Jacob's talking about what's going on in his life, and I suppose my bit is behind the scenes. So um, Jacob's really disinterested in his life. He doesn't really want to talk about the NDIS. When we first started saying, do you want to talk about the NDIS? He'll say, what did you say? Do you want to talk about the NDIS? He said, no. Didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's boring. Really, what he wants to talk about is his life, and, and that's really what's important. Um, so Jacob's life's not perfect. There's still um, gaps in what's going on. Um, there's, you know, there's still parts of Jake's day where he hasn't got enough to do. But we feel like we're on the right track. Um, we're always looking for opportunities and we find things like, for example, Toastmasters has opened the door to a, a whole range of things, including catching up with a friend from Toastmasters today, well, well this week while we're in Melbourne, um, trivia nights and things like that. So you sort of, one door opens and, um, and it continues. <coughs> so um, I think the thing that I want to also say and with what Deb said as well is that the NDIS didn't make this happen. A good life doesn't happen to people by accident. You need to have this idea, we have this idea of having a vision, or this idea of um, actively working towards a good life for Jacob. Um, it just, the, the funding's great. My NDIS is great and I applaud it, but it's not um, going to, that in itself won't make the difference. Um, so there's new and interesting way, new and interesting, new and, crazy ways to segregate people with disability. The NDIS has brought new ways in for that to happen. Or the NDIS didn't make it happen. But without that idea of a good life included in the community, not that parallel life, then um, you would just find more people, more people with disabilities segregated. And just, you know, I find myself, you know, I know it's immature, but that face palm kind of thing. Um, quite often, um, just this week, I heard about, um, you know, Newcastle, I don't know if anyone's been to Newcastle, it's got beautiful beaches, lovely parks. Do it, but a lot of people really seem to like it. And um, so, you know, we, there's, you know, any time of the day you go along to the beach, you'll see someone being yelled at or doing exercise. I suppose it's not really the yelling at that's a point, it's the exercise. And um, so I was just talking to someone at a service the other day, and they, they've got special boot camp. I'm like, what? So it's, it's just, you know, I just I pretty much hear a story like that every week where something that's ordinary in the community, you know, um, but we've, they, we create that parallel life for people with disability. So I just wanted to make that point that the NDIS won't make an included life. You've got to really have that idea of a vision for an included life. Um, I'll talk a little bit about myself um, and Mind the Gap. Mind the Gap um, started as most good things with a couple of friends and a bottle of wine um, a few years ago, about three or four years ago. And uh, initially we thought we'd be just working with service providers. And I suppose what happened was a couple of friends um, and myself, we sort of found quite often we're talking with service providers and getting paid with soggy sandwiches and things like that. And we thought maybe we'd, if we um, you know, ask for money, they might give it to us if we become a company. And things evolve. Um, pretty quickly after we started, the NDIS was announced in Newcastle and, um, and then, of course, there's a lot of interest in the NDIS um, and we were able to assist then in establishing a user-led organisation um, to support people with disabilities in a very similar way to the way Belonging Matters does. Um, it's run by people with disability, uh, for people with disability um, and their families, so people with disability and their families. Um, so it's called Community Disability Alliance Hunter. So that sort of really got me sort of out, in, out into Newcastle and meeting a lot more families and doing a lot of talking about the NDIS and thinking about it. And as things evolve as they do, um, the work of Mind the Gap kind of evolved too. What we found was that people, where the struggles were, where people were having with the NDIS. And I suppose we sort of then began sort of filling those gaps where we could see people struggling. Sometimes sort of feel like the NDIS is a sausage factory, so you go in one door and you come out the other and the difficulties we were seeing is, first of all, when people were going in and being prepared and secondly, coming out with this plan and what the heck to do with it. So that's sort of where we kind of decided to, um, to register with the NDIS to provide support coordinations and uh, plan management. And I'll explain a little bit about how they work later on in the day. So basically, uh, like the elevator sort of um, version of what we do is 
We assist people to self-direct their support. So that means that we assist people to make the decisions about their support and we might be able to, they might delegate some tasks to us so they can do that. Essentially, we would like to, um, we want to make self-direction easy and doable and sustainable. And we have, we sort of, if we might, we don't provide direct support, so we're independent. Um, but we say, if people come to us with the need of assistance, we might not be able to provide that our systems out ourselves, but we can find somebody who can. So that's, so I work with about 30 families, so we're still a very, very small organisation. Um, so there's, yeah, about 30 families. I'm going to talk about some of those families today. I have their permission to speak about them. And some of the people I'm talking about, I also have permission to speak about, but they're not, they're not people who use our services. The NDIS has um, brought new lingo to us. Um, one of them is goals and aspirations, um, which, being a bit dyslexic, I tend to write jails. And then I, aspirations is when things go down the wrong way. So I tend to refer to those as having a vision for yourself. Um, and choice and control. The other j piece of jargon that um, Deb referred to was reasonable and necessary, what we regard as reasonable and necessary, um, which is really hard to know because you know it's, it's one of those very sort of debatable things. So I've got two tips today, and they're about vision and self-direction. That's my two tips when you go into the NDIS. And the vision is about when you walk in the door of the NDIS, being really clear about what you want, and the self-direction is coming out of the NDIS and making the decisions about how that happens. Um, there's some really great questions there. I can't answer all of them, um, but there's some I might be able to sort of answer anecdotally as we go through. Um, that's based on the people that I'm working with and the people I know in Newcastle. But I don't understand DIS and um, so it's perhaps more an example of where I can see some of those answers that might be appropriate. A lot of people are really concerned about walking in the door of the NDIS. So how do you get in? How do you get in? How do you get in? Um, uh, Deb's outlined a variety of ways. If you're already receiving services, it's almost an automatic referral. If you're, um, if you're not, then you can just ring up, knock on the door, go in. Um, what, we f um, what we find though is, what do you do when you get there? And that's what I want to talk about. What, what are you going to do when you get down to, when you sit down with the planner? And that's the person you see with the NDIS. What are you going to do when you sit down with the planner? And um, what are you going to, you know, what are you going to discuss? So you're going to hear me talk about visions a lot. Um, let not our needs determine our dreams, but our, let our dreams determine our needs. And I think that should be a bit of a mantra when we're thinking about the NDIS, rather than going and thinking about what our needs are and how they can be filled, actually think about what our dreams are. It's, it's kind of a different way of think, thinking about it. The intent and the importance of our goals and aspirations are what, you know, or our dreams is what the NDIS is about. That's what the intent of the NDIS is about. That's why it's introduced that new language to us um, of goals and aspirations. And I think the thing I want to say is if you don't have a vision for yourself or you don't have a vision for your family member, someone else will come up with a vision and it won't be particularly good. So as Deb talked about before, there's pretty different paths that people with disabilities can go down very, very easily. So if you think about um, the, the path that people with disability tend to take, it's sort of often special school um, respite, uh, day programs, um, sheltered workshops, group homes. That's, the sort of, that's, that's really, really typical. Whereas you think of a person who's not labelled with a disability, they've got a whole range more of opportunities. It's, you know, school, part-time job, university, um, TAFE, um, hobbies and interests, just, you know, doing what, you know, might go to the boot camp if you, that's your thing that floats your boat. Um, it, the, it, there's a whole range of things. It's sort of endless, you know, partners, your own home, all those kind of things. And I think the NDIS is an opportunity for us to actually have a vision for those things, those coloured things, those things that make life really, really interesting and sort of really start to look beyond the typical life pose for people with disability. 
So this is Georgia, and this is a quote from her father. So um, the purpose of life, with the, um, the purpose of life is to have a purpose, essentially. And um, the, Georgia is um, a new colleague of mine. Georgia has just started. Um, this is her a picture of Georgia. For anyone who can't see that, it's a picture of Georgia. Um, it's on her birthday just recently. She's just opened a present. She's pretty happy with herself. She's pretty pleased with herself. Georgia um, is a new colleague. She's just starting a micro business. Um, she's and she's been doing some work with me. I'm one of her clients. And it's a small but growing business, a small but growing clientele. And I think this is really interesting because um, Georgia now, because of the NDIS, and she's only been on the NDIS for about four months, the whole path of her life is changing massively. No longer is she a client, she is now a service provider, someone providing service to others, including me. Um, so Georgia's business is to shred uh, confidential documents. Uh, she's blind, so she's really, really confidential about the printed material she's shredding. <laughs> so, um, so that's you know, so she's she's got a lot to offer there. Uh, she's also really good fun, and um, when she comes to the office to shred, uh, we usually have YouTube going and singing and things like that. So it's sort of really, um, it's a really fun day, a fun, fun afternoon when Georgia's when we're working with Georgia. We get work done. But it's, it's perhaps a little bit more interesting. Did you say what disability she has? Oh, she has, she, uh, she is blind. She has an intellectual disability and autism. Um, Georgia left school nine years ago and she was in South Wales community participation. In the words of her dad, um, you know, he says it, they called it community participation, um, but it, it was not, she wasn't participating and she wasn't in the community. It was a bit of a misnomer. Um, she was doing the same thing every day and it all centred around uh, food and endless, aimless leisure. Um, a lot of people in, um, that I'm working with uh, have actually developed weight problems because of the emphasis on lunch in the day program. So that's, George is just one of many people that I know who, um, who really have to sort of you know, change her eating style and, and actually leaving the day program has enabled that to happen. So the NDIS actually enabled the, Georgia's family to start looking for something different. So, she, so Georgia, uh, she left the day program, so the NDIS enabled her to leave the day program and really start pursuing other things, including exercise and a more healthy lifestyle. Um, she started um, doing some gardening at her family's house as well, so she's actually growing the best, what do you call them? Um, uh, what do you call, are they like peas things? I've had lovely fresh vegetables went over there, snow peas and things like that. So, um, so Georgia's life has really dramatically, within a very short period of time, changed. Um, so it's given Georgia and her family more opportunities for choice um, and to tailor a meaningful life for Georgia. And her family are hoping that Georgia will um, the, you know, her, she'll be. In, you know, Georgia is enjoying her um, her contribution. I think the thing that I found really, really lovely was um, the first uh, the, the day after she, the first day that Georgia came to my house. Um, well, I have a home office, that's why she's coming to my house. I will have an office in my home. But the first day Georgia came over to do some shredding with us. The next day, uh, her dad texted me, and she'd been he'd overheard her on the phone to her grandma, and she's. Grandma, I'm now working with Linda Hughes, and she was just really proud of that. And I think that she's now working with a whole bunch of other organisations. I think she's got five clients, so it's quite a change. Um, so her family are really keen on her having these, you know, acquiring these valued roles and hoping that as one door opens, one door will open more doors for, for Georgia. They want her to become, you know, more independent, and there's more opportunities for that rather than sitting in a chair most days at the day program. Um, and they want Georgia to, you know, to actually start using some more technology to assist her, particularly around her mobility because of her vision impairment. Um, and yeah, so it's, 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 this kind of, I suppose, really came about because um, one of the things I think that their, uh, Georgia's parents were initially thinking when the NDAS was coming in, they thought, great, we can lead this day program. There's got to be another better day program. And they kept looking and there was not another Dead Better Day program. What, there was a bet, what they found was a good life for Georgia. They developed this vision of a good life for Georgia. And one of the things, I suppose, how they developed that was by talking with other people, 
by meeting with other families. They became involved in Community Disability Alliance Hunter that I mentioned before, the user-led organisation, um, and they began hearing stories from other parents and it sort of really opened up their eyes to more opportunities. I'm going to talk about New and Exciting Friday and that might be a place to have a break as well. Uh, this, is, um, this is Jeremy and um, Jeremy's a guy who's got a number of challenges. He, um, he can get very stressed out in, in new situations or in unusual situations. He really likes his routine and he's really, really, if it came to his choice, his mum said that his choice would be to stay at home and do nothing. That would be Jeremy's choice because he got very stressed out being out. Um, and he'd behave in ways that made other people, you know, a bit scared of him um, or, you know, it was bit, he behaved in ways that made people feel um, a little bit uncertain about how to approach him and things like that. So this was about three years ago, um, he left school and his mum's like, gosh, what are we going to do now? Jeremy would like to stay at home. He did start going to a day program um, and sort of spent most of his time there. Um, the other thing about Jeremy is, I suppose, when he feels stressed, what he does is he leaves the situation and usually at a bolt. So um, Jeremy's uh, found himself in some really um, unsafe situations because he's, um, he's, he's got anxious and, and stressed and he's, he's left. So, um, so, you know, there's some real safety issues around, you know, safeguarding issues that, that need to be considered um, with Jeremy, um, particularly when things aren't routine and he might be uncomfortable. So I, I love what his mum's done. Um, his mum and his auntie decided to start New and Exciting Friday. And that's the routine, is New and Exciting Friday is every Friday, it's new and exciting. And every Friday they come up with something new and exciting to do. But once it's done, it can be transferred into the week. If, Je if Jeremy likes it, it can be transferred into the week and he can do it more often. So um, going to the beach was just something that couldn't be considered um, because of the a whole range of um, sort of, uh, I suppose, sensitivities that uh, Jeremy had. But look at him there. He's, he's loving it. He's loving it. So just by, um, uh, I suppose, by... Uh, I, d I love the idea of just, you know, making something a routine, but it's different. And it just really opened up a whole range of opportunities for Jeremy. Um, and, and his mum certainly has a vision for him um, being included in the community and they've just started with the NDIS and just starting on their journey. Um, so I just wanted to just, I'll finish with this little point just about choice um, because choice and control is really um, an important aspect of the NDIS and people with disabilities making choices and having control of their life and having control of their support is really important. Sometimes, often, People with disabilities haven't had very many experiences. They haven't had opportunities to experience um, a lot of things that people without disabilities might just experience with, um, through, their, through their lives. Um, so when you have little, limited experience, it's very, very hard to make an informed decision. Um, and then his, here is a sticky wicket for us as parents, and I feel I was thinking about this and I thought, oh gosh, yes, you know, when Jacob talks about me being bossy. Um, what experiences a person might have and how realistic those might, like parents get to choose what experiences our sons and daughters might have and we might decide that something's unrealistic, but it might be realistic if we give it a chance. You know, choice, and I think choices are empty and don't really mean anything unless it also includes these other things as well. So choice is really about belonging, being respected, sharing ordinary places, so that's being in the community, it's sharing ordinary places at the same time, not in your special boot camp, it's a boot camp with everybody else, contributing and then choosing. So I think that's sort of where I think that, you know, while choice, and, choice is important, it really needs to be aligned with those other aspects of it, otherwise it's become some sort of empty choice of limited options. Okay, so I think Deb's already discussed the good life. I think when we think about a, what a, a good life would be for people with disabilities, it's the same as it is for all of us. You know, it's that idea of having relationships, friends, family, connections, acquaintances, um, you wouldn't believe how important well-meaning acquaintances can be in your life as well, you know. Um, it's about people who, having people to love and care for you. It's an anchor in your life when, you've had someone who when you have someone who loves and cares for you. It really keeps you anchored. It's, it's really, you know, um, important for all of us. 
um, a sense of belonging, a home, sorry, a home and a sense of belonging and security. I think you know, I think the test for me with the, um, with the home is who has the keys to the front door and who, has, who decides who walks through the front door because there's a lot of people who live in home, houses where they don't choose who comes through the front door. So I think when we think about home, that's what home is. You decide who walks through that door. Um, work and leisure and things that you like to do. And these are all in, you know, unique to all of us. Um, making a contribution and feeling valued. Of course, enough money is lovely. <laughs> um, and, and also good health. So they're the sort of things that we, I think we could all universally agree on are about a good life. Does that, do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. So I suppose when we're thinking about um, our vision for Jacob, oh, actually, I just want to might go back. Um, one of the things I suppose um, we're thinking about with Jacob is, at the moment is um, Jacob leaving home. He's 23. So um, I left home when I was 18. So I think that you or Jacob are a bit of a, a, bit of a stay at home. Um, but I think the other thing about, you know, we, we sort of often say that we live in domestic bliss because we pretty much do. Um, but I don't have a crystal ball and I don't, you know, I think that um, there's a couple of points to this. Um, firstly, we know that Jacob really likes it when I'm away. <laughs> So he has a really good time when I'm away, and I know, and you know, he's kind of miffed when I get back. In fact, quite miffed sometimes. That you know, you again, like you know, didn't I get rid of you? Um, so we know that Jacob, you know, doesn't really depend on me in that way that a younger child would, um, which is quite typical of a 23-year-old. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, so you know, I, I was unable to provide support to Jacob then I would um, then, in a sudden sort of way, then it would become a crisis and in crisis situations, bad things tend to happen. Bad decisions, well, not bad decisions are made, but you, people make these very pragmatic decisions which might not have the person's best interest at heart because they're dealing with a crisis. Um, so I suppose, you know, not having that crystal ball there. And also, I just know that Jacob would have just great fun sharing a house possibly with um, other people his age. So we're kind of looking at how can that, you know, how that's sort of part of our vision for Jacob just now. You know, so when we sort of think about it, we sort of, whoops, we go, you know, okay, so like I suppose this is more sort of generally when we're thinking about our vision for Jacob. It's sort of, so you've got that good life that I've sort of talked about before, but then you sort of, you know, that most people sort of aspire to, but then you sort of place it around that who is Jacob. And, um, and just knowing who Jacob is, we just know that Jacob wouldn't like living alone. We know that Jacob really enjoys company. I suspect he wants flatmates who share his passion for Harry Potter um, and football. And um, so that's the sort of thing that we might start thinking about if we sort of were to run through that, looking, you know, thinking about Jacob and leaving home. Can I click on? Um, this is just about uh, benefits of being in the community. Um, I might click on from that because I think you all understand that. I think that's, that this is a lot of stuff that Deb, five minutes, so this is a lot of stuff that Deb covered this morning. So um, there's, I think, does it, does it, do you want me to go through that or is that fine? I think there's maybe some NDIS stuff might be really good. So connecting to the community. So our vision for Jacob, it's, I feel like we've sort of covered it. You know, we want Jacob to have friends, um, relationships. We want, him to be, we want him to be a lifelong learner as well. We just know that, um, you know, I'm still studying. I'm doing a course this semester again. Um, it's part of our family culture to sort of, you know, to, to be lifelong learners. And I think we all are. There's some things I don't want to learn. I think there's some things that, you know, you know, I sort of go with technology. I just, I, I, my head is full of enough technology stuff. I don't need to learn any more of that, which means I'm pretty inept technologi technologically wise. But, but I think generally that you know we want Jacob to continue his opportunities to learn. Um, we want um, Jacob to work and make a valuable, valuable contribution. Um, and so if he's getting some paid work doing um, speaking. He was also, you know, it's important that he holds down voluntary roles as well. So um, it puts Jacob in the heart of the community by holding down voluntary roles, but it's also, you know, adding to his sense of worth and, um, and other people seeing 
how, how you know, seeing his sense of worth as well. Um, I think it's really, um, and I suppose people start to look when you know people are out in the community and holding valued roles. People look beyond the disability and start to see the capacities of people rather than the um, the things that are their disability. So. Yeah, we want Jacob to have friends. We want him to be well known in the community. And I really believe this is an important safeguard. Um, in those parallel lives, um, people are far more vulnerable. Uh, when you're well connected to the community, there's safeguards. There are things that start to go wrong. There's people who notice and there's people to intervene. Um, so that's, I really sort of feel that for Jacob, for those connections is, is the really important safeguard in his life. We want him to always be uh, treated with dignity and respect um, and we want him to live with people who care about him. So when we go back to thinking about leaving home and thinking about who would Jacob live with, it's, we're going to be putting lots and lots of thought into that. Um, and, and Jacob, of course, will be the person who decides ultimately. So we want him to be seen for his individual gifts and skills and his um, fun-loving personality which he's very, very serious this morning. <laughs> it's not usually what we get from Jacob. Um, I think the importance of having a vision, a positive vision for somebody, is it guides you. It's when things are sort of rocking you this way and that, if you actually have a vision, you can think, well, is this taking me in the direction that I want to go? Or is it going to take me off course? It's like a compass. And I think that's really, really important to having a vision. So my first tip is when you go to the NDIS, you need to be able to convey a positive vision for the future. You have to convey a positive vision, um, which might, you know, which really comes down to having those goals and aspirations. So, the, so having that vision is, some, is, is your goals and aspirations. The, the form that you fill in for the NDIS is about your vision, and that you just need to really start thinking about it now. I think that it's, um, you need to invite positive people to think with you because having a devil's advocate in the group is really, really difficult to, to negotiate. And I suppose we've found that sort of when we've been thinking about positive visions for Jacob as well. Share with other people what you're thinking about and see what other people are doing. L hear the stories of other people who are living a good life, who are doing things that are beyond the disability sector, you know, beyond that, that section, that parallel life and start, you know, they're the people who've got, you know, who you should be listening to um, because uh, it's inspiring actually. It just tells you what might be possible. I think that we often get very, very limited of what's possible when we have a family member or have a disability ourselves. Um, you've got to write down your ideas and it might be just having a notepad beside the bed and waking up at two o'clock in the morning going, I have an idea and just jotting it down and having a look at it in the morning and, and whether it sort of makes sense or or not, <laughs> um, but you need to start now. So the NDIS is coming to your area in the next year or so, so it's re I'm really saying start now, start thinking big, um, because this is going to be what's going to be useful when you walk in the door of the NDIS. And now it's time for a break. <laughs>